We are glad you're here this morning as we jump in today. Come alive in the name of Jesus. So today, what I'm going to be talking about is really coming alive in the name of Jesus, just like we just sung, because God has so much that he wants to reveal to us today through the power of his word and through the power of prayer. Now, over the last few weeks, I have been covering our values here at Harvest Connection. The first one was the Word of God. We talked about three ways the Word of God comes to us through the Logos, through the Graphe, through the Rhema, right? And then we talked about honor. That's our second value here. So oftentimes today, we simply honor the expert instead of honoring the sage. Give me the person who's walked it. Give me the person who is older. Give me the person with gray hair. I don't even get an amen out of that. Amen. I finally heard it. So honor, honor is so important because in our culture today, go back and listen to that that message, if you will. Our culture today has forgotten what it means to honor, to be honorable, to be honoring. And then we talked about fruitfulness, the importance of a church bearing fruit. Because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. In John chapter 15, he says this. He says, this is... The Father is glorified that you bear much fruit to prove out that you are my disciples. John 15. So fruitfulness, that we bear much fruit, is really a command from Jesus. The fourth thing we talked about was excellence, the importance of living a life of excellence, a life that shines, a light, a life that is a light. And then we talked about healthy relationships, number five. And then number six was the importance of giving. And number seven, last week, we talked about worship, but that goes together. Many of you who have gone through membership class know it's worship and prayer. And now I'm going to break down prayer for the next three weeks. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm painting with a large brush, but that brush is going to become narrow before we're done in the next three weeks. Maybe you don't understand prayer. I understand that. I do. You know why I understand that you don't understand? Because the disciples didn't understand. They had to come to Jesus and say, teach us to pray. And so it's okay. As a matter of fact, in all of these values, uh, every time I preach a value series, I want you to know that uh, we lose people. It happens every time. And the reason why is because people are saying, well, I don't tithe. And so I guess I'm not worthy of your membership. Well, I don't read my Bible every day. I'm not worthy of your membership. I pray, but I'm not like the Apostle Paul. I don't pray continuously, and that's a command. And so because of those things, I guess I just don't fit. Listen, it's both a now and not yet. When we have seven values, what we're saying is, this is what we believe a disciple looks like. These are things that disciples of Jesus Christ do. But all of us are in some place in life. We're in training. We're learning. We're growing. We're discovering. And so the reason I I teach and preach on our values is to say, this is what our church understands to be a disciple. These are things that we uphold, and we're encouraging and teaching you to receive these as truths in your own life. And so that's where we are today when we talk about prayer. Because these disciples were walking with Jesus and yet didn't know how to pray. If you'll please stand for the reading of the scripture this morning, it comes to us from Luke chapter 11. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us. Now notice, very important, you got to get this part. This disciple didn't say, teach me to pray. This disciple said, teach us to pray. You're going to see that's very important in just a moment. Just as John taught his disciples, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You may be seated. Let's look at one other. Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 10 is uh, in some ways a similitude to what we see happening in Luke, the scripture that we just read in chapter 11. And you'll be familiar with this one. Jesus says, and when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, let's be honest. Many of us don't pray because we feel like the prayers that we throw up simply don't stick. 
We're throwing them up there, but some, someone's not listening. Someone's not hearing me because I'm in desperate need, and I don't believe that my prayer is big enough, that my life is big enough for a huge God, a God of the universe, to hear my simple little voice. Does he really hear me? Is he really there? Some of us feel like our problems are way too small for our big God. Other people's prayers are, are possibly more important, and he has to deal with their prayers before he can get to my prayers. I really don't believe in the power of prayer. There are many who just simply don't believe in the power of prayer. The few things that I prayed for in life simply didn't happen, so I quit praying. We can find all kinds of excuses, church. You know, as I was writing this, I thought, what was my first experience where I saw God answer a prayer? Now, you're going to think this is silly because it simply is. But when I was probably in the second grade, I had a cat disappear. His name was Sir Lancelot. <laughs> and Sir Lancelot disappeared. And after a couple of weeks, I asked my mother about him. She said, well, you know, tomcats are just tomcats. They just go and wonder. And I'm like, well, we're in the middle of nowhere. Where's he going to go? And she probably knew the answer to that. But she said, here's what you can do. Curtis, you can pray. Pray for Lancelot. No prayer is too small for our God. And I've never forgotten that. And so I began to pray every morning for Lancelot. About six months later, I don't know exactly, five or six months, Lancelot shows up. And one of his legs is so disfigured that he just drags it, and it's just one solid sore. And his front leg is all messed up, and he's, he's, he's drawn up to nearly nothing. I don't even know how he survived. And I think in many ways, God was like, it would probably have been better if you would have forgotten about Lancelot. But since you asked, and because you have the prayer of faith as a child, I'll show you Lancelot. And I was like, I don't want this cat. That thing's nasty. <laughs> the second prayer that I had in life that I remember God answering was praying for a watch. Now, back in the day, I had saved up my money. I was in the third grade. I know this because I was still in the elementary school there at Tulia. And, and so I had, had saved up for a watch that was $15. It was a Kronos watch, which means it had the hands like this clock up here. My dad would not let me get a, a, uh, one of the digital watches because he simply said, you need to learn how to tell time on a real watch. And so I had saved up for this Timex because I wanted a Timex. The commercial back in the day was simply Timex takes a licking, but keeps on. All right. Some of you are old enough to remember. And so I had saved up about $7.50. Seven the watch was $15. My parents met me halfway. I purchased this watch. I was so proud of it. And one day on the playground in third grade elementary school, I lost the watch. And my mother reminded me, just pray for it. And months went by, months went by. I'm talking about I lost it actually in the fall, and it would be in May, but right before school was out, and I had prayed and prayed for this watch. A kid found this watch, and he started running around the playground saying, look at what I found. And I was like, that's mine. He's like, no, it isn't. I said, I'll prove it with this. Anyway, <laughs> I prayed hard for the power of God. No, I'm, what happened there was uh, the teachers, I'd already told the teachers and everything, and they were helping me look for the watch all year. And finally, they said, no, that does belong to him. I got my watch back. I think about prayers in my life that went what I would call unanswered. A time when a man had lost his first wife to cancer, and I've shared this before, his second wife comes up with the same type of cancer. And I said, there is no way that this would happen to this man twice. And so I am anointing her with, with oil. I'm praying over her. I was, I was frequenting their house. And then when she would go into the hospital, I would pray over her. He still knew the nurses. The nurses still knew him by name from the loss of his first wife to this type of cancer. And so I, in some ways, found myself demanding God's presence, healing presence to be upon her life. And one day as I was going to Amarillo, he called me and he said she just passed away, his second wife to the same type of cancer. 
It was at that moment I almost left the ministry. I found myself on my knees in my office crying and begging God and asking him, why can't you answer my prayer? Why does this man have to experience pain not once but twice? I don't get it and I don't understand it. And I wrote a song about it, but (laughs) you sure don't want me to sing it. You will pray. But it was a difficult time in my life, even going back and reading my journal. I can't hardly read that time and that season in my life. I think about my own mother whose life was taken by Lou Gehrig's disease and what it means to go in and start fighting and swinging and not being able to hit the enemy. You know, I I never was a good fighter, but I would fight. And that's what it felt like in my prayer life. God, can you even hear? I'm swinging, but I'm just shadow boxing. It's not effective. I'm fasting. And the only thing that's happening that's positive is I'm losing weight. You ever find yourself in that place where you feel like you failed? Was there a prayer I could have saved, could have said that possibly would have saved my mother? And there's morning still, I wake up. And it's tough. I pray for a church. And sometimes I swing at the enemy and I feel like I miss. And say, Lord, you got to show me. You know, sometimes our prayers are desperate in that way. And they should be. I call those types of prayers tornado prayers. Let me tell you what a tornado prayer is. When I was a kid, there was a tornado that hit Tulia, and it was coming east of Tulia. We lived 15 miles east of Tulia. Our phone was ringing. We were going outside, and we were watching this tornado kind of come towards us. So we ran out to a cellar, which was at an old house. We had, my parents had built a new house, and there was an old house next to it. And we went down in that cellar, and the rain was just pouring down in that cellar. Matter of fact, we killed a den of rattlesnakes in that cellar. Uh, so dad had a hoe. But before we ran out there, my mother said this. She said, hey, every one of you kids go grab your Bible by your bed and carry your Bible down or take your Bible with us. And we went down there and we were praying and we were afraid and I was just a small kid, but I still remember. And the tornado, as you know, didn't hit us. Several years later, I lived in the big metropolis of Arnie. And it was myself and Allison. And sure enough, one day on the news, it comes over, if you're in Arnie, take cover, there's a tornado. And I was like, Allison, we made the news. And she's like, oh, my gosh, what do we do? And so we run in the basement, right? And we had a tornado prayer right there in the basement. And there were a lot of funny things to say about what happened that day because I had just told her while we were downstairs, hey, as long as it's raining, as long as it's hailing, as long as the wind's blowing, it's my understanding that you'll hear like the sound of a locomotive and all that stuff stops. And right when I said it, it all happened. It stopped. (laughs) And so... uh, a few years later, as a matter of fact, uh, it would be May 5th, 2002, there would be a tornado that uh, really affected the city of Happy where I was pastoring at the time. And it was a difficult thing. I was over with three or four other guys as we were uh, digging through the rubble and um, discovered two bodies that had perished in the tornado and pulled them out and it was too late to do CPR or anything else and we loaded on an ambulance their son, their only son. A difficult thing. A lot of prayers went into that. The tornado prayers. Uh, that, that very time, I was actually headed out to uh, uh, my land. I had eight head of horses out there at the time, and I had pulled over, and Bill Johnson had pulled up next to me, and he was facing this way. I was facing into it. And, and I simply asked him, I said, hey, all those weather watchers say that cloud is about to drop a tornado, and they're all moving out of here. Uh, and I asked Bill this. I said, do I have time to go from here and feed my horses real quick and head back into town? What do you think, Bill? And he was like, and if you know Bill, he wasn't a fast speaker. He's a cowboy. And, and so as, as Bill started discussing things with me, the land, the tornado didn't come down. No kidding. The land in front of me went straight up in the air. It was that quick. And I looked over to see Bill, and he was gone. <laughs> and, and from there on, I used to tell Bill Johnson, you left your pastor to deal with a tornado. 
I needed prayer at that time. I was facing into the tornado. And as I turned around, I was in a little Chevy S10 pickup. I finally hit third gear. My pickup started shuddering and I could see it in, in my rear view mirror. And this is the very tornado that would hit happy. And there was a horse shed to my left that just started rolling away. And I was praying as I was putting my seatbelt on, Lord, please, not this way. I mean, you know, Enoch was swept up into heaven, but I mean, Lord. Those are tornado prayers. Those are prayers of emergency. Those are prayers for no doubt. Right now, Lord, I need you right now. And those are good prayers, but how do we get God to move on our behalf? Here's our problem. The first problem we have is we think God moves by need. Listen to me. God is not moved by need. God is moved by faith. By faith alone. That's how God is moved. Faith is the currency that moves God. A prayer of a righteous man shall availeth much is what the book of James tells us. God is moved. Look, if God were moved by need, there would be no starving. There would be no need to clothe the naked because God would have already clothed them because there's a need there. There would be no need to feed the hungry because God would have already fed the hungry. He calls and allows us to live in Him through faith. See, I'll say a couple of things here that, that, that do create tensions in, in us. You will not pray if you don't know who God is or who you are. Prayer is communication. We communicate with those whom we know. If you don't know who God is, you won't know who you are. All creation yearns to know its creator. We all want to know our purpose, what God forms. I've said this many times, he feels. When God formed the world, he did what? He began to fill it. On the second day, he created this. On the third day, he created this. When God forms man, he breathed the breath of life into him. He filled mankind. He filled us with his breath because what God forms, he fills. And the neat thing about that is he is our creator, and many of us don't even know that, and yet he's calling to us every day, I just want you to know me. Because in each one of us, there is a vacancy. There is an absence to know him. You were created with it. If you will, a void. And in this void, it is calling us to know our Creator. See, some feel that prayer is more of a last resort. After all other efforts fail, well, I guess we can still pray. Come on, church. That's a dangerous prayer there. I don't know how God's going to get us out of this one. I just hope He does. Now, hear me. God cares about our needs. God cares about our needs. But we pray for our needs through a prayer of faith. It's through faith. See, the domain of darkness, the church, to the domain of darkness, I think so oftentimes the church looks like a bunch of confused, defeated beggars. But that's not who we are. We are the sons and daughters of God. And I'm talking about those of you who are a part of the church. We are the sons and daughters of God. We are not slaves to God. We are the sons and the daughters of God. Of God. And we, according to Scripture, have received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We have been called to execute the will of the kingdom and to put it on display throughout the world. Did you hear what I said? So that means that we should have a declarative prayer. If you're going to execute the kingdom of God upon this world, it should be declarative. Stop looking to Washington to get us out of this mess. Psalm 121 says, our help comes from the Lord. Heaven won't invade because Joe Biden falls on his knees. Washington's not going to save you. We have the power of prayer upon us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit within us that connects us to our Creator, and our Creator has told us to go into all the world and bring my kingdom. Chris Vallotton, he says this, prayer is the catalyst for the world transformation. It incites the angels, restrains the darkness, and releases nations into their destiny. Prayer is the catalyst to get things moving, the answer for our city, our region, our nation, for his kingdom to come. 
What is God's ultimate will for us here on planet earth? That his kingdom would invade the earth through his children. Matthew 28, 19 says, go into all the world and do what? Make disciples. Now, like I say, in the original Greek text form, it says go and disciple them. Do you know why it says that? It says it that way because Jesus had the expectation that his disciples would be upon the earth already. So he's telling us, go and disciple them. Disciple more into my kingdom. Teach them my ways. Teach them my values. Teach them who I am. It begins with prayer. Jesus said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that interesting? He says, your will or your kingdom, your will on earth as in heaven. So this prayer is not used to incite the favor of God for our favorite football teams, even though I've tried. It's not a recipe to go out and manipulate God into our favor. You know, that's one of our problems in our relationships today is we don't listen to understand. We simply listen to reply, and we do this oftentimes with God. We're not hearing to understand. We just want to defend our goal, our plan, our purpose, our words that we speak. But what does it mean for his kingdom to come first and not our own? You know, when Jesus taught this, he was doing something so powerful. It was so provocative. It has been misrepresented oftentimes through the ages. To understand the magnitude of Jesus' statement, remember, if you'll think about this, and, and we think about declarative prayer, and what he's saying, he's saying, hey, we need to pray for his kingdom to be upon this earth. We need to know what it is to be a part of his kingdom. And when he does that, he's kind of, uh, I think one of the illustrations that I have in here for us to look at is some of you will remember the Cold War when tensions were so high between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. I still have study cards from the army what a, what a Russian tank, the, the Russian tanks, we had to memorize all these cards, what they were, what they looked like. Same thing with their aircraft. Imagine if Ronald Reagan would have taken an American flag. Now, here's the truth. I wasn't in during Ronald Reagan's time, but we were post-Cold War. But imagine if Ronald Reagan would have taken an American flag, flew over to the Soviet Union, got off of Air Force One, went to Moscow, and right in front of the cap Capitol, he took the flag, he staked it in the ground, and yelled, this land belongs to the United States of America. That's pretty radical. Well, some of us need to get radical with God's kingdom. We need to start claiming ground and staking ground. Now, it's not through, through weapons formed of man. It's through weapons formed of the Spirit. But how do we know even how the Spirit moves outside of kneeling down, praying, and accepting His will, His kingdom? You know, after the church was born, Peter and John, they were doing signs and wonders Kingdom was invading. It really turned Jerusalem upside down. They were thrown in jail. They were finally released. And I want to pick up a scripture here. And for time's sake, uh, men and women back there on, on, with, responsible for our screen, I want to go to Acts chapter 4, verse 27. So they're quoting David. They've just quoted David. They're declaring that Jesus is king. And it's, it's declaratory here with these apostles, Peter and John. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. So these guys are saying, let us keep, even though we've been thrown in prison, anything else, let us keep staking ground for your kingdom to come. Let us declare with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they're not even taking credit for their prayer. They're simply saying, hey, when we pray, it's through the powerful name of Jesus that these things are happening. And then it says, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak with the word of God, to, to speak the word of God with all boldness. That they continued to speak the word of God, to make their declaration, to stake their ground, their territory. Have you ever done this, prayed his kingdom come in your marriage? To stake your kingdom. Satan, you know how you don't have any power, no authority in my marriage. 
I stake ground, I claim ground here in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, there's a declarative prayer from the children. There are values that are expressed to the children of God. We just learned from the apostles here that they continue to pray in boldness, understanding the power of the kingdom invading the earth. I like to call this the earthquake prayer meeting. Because that's what it was. It says that while they were gathered together, the whole place was shaken. It was shaking. It was such a powerful prayer that they were giving. The kingdom invaded. They all had just gotten out of jail. And yet they prayed for more boldness, more signs, more wonders. See, when God's kingdom comes, it shakes things up. The power of darkness trembles. It cannot stand against it. In prayer, we can partner with Jesus to shake these things up, to see his kingdom invade upon this earth. The scripture, and you'll find this out throughout the next couple of weeks of teaching and preaching, but you'll see where Jesus often withdrew himself to pray. In other words, he got away from from all the things of the world where he could just sit with, with his father And that's why Jesus speaks first. He says, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, because our Father desires to sit with us. He desires to teach us. He desires to love us. He desires to encourage us. He desires to show us. He does not leave us alone is what the Scripture says. When you pray, we partner with Jesus on earth as it is. In heaven, we pray your kingdom, not ours. Lord, there's a lot of things that I will in this life. Lord, there's a lot of things that I want in this life. Lord, I'm not where I thought I would be at this point in my life, according to my fleshly desires. But Jesus doesn't even go down that road. He says, no, thy will, thy kingdom, that comes first. You know how it feels. When you have a son or daughter finally get a value of yours, you know what that is? I like to share this story the first time we pull up and Wade actually got out of the car and went over and picked up a piece of trash on his own without being told in the yard. I was like, what did you just do, son? He's like, dad, that's worth about $250. I'm like, no. You just expressed one of our values. It makes you feel good, and this is how God sees us when we're asking him, Lord, show us what you created us for in order to bring your kingdom upon this earth. Not my kingdom, not my wants, not my desires, not my direction, but what you have called me to do in this life because not only did you form me, watch this, if people would just get this part, Jeremiah 1. God knew us before we were knit together in our mother's womb. He had a plan and a purpose for this time in our lives. Watch, for eternity. This is crazy. I, 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 at one time I preached a sermon. Some of y'all remember when we were facing the other direction. We were, we were going that way. Fortunately, we, we realized Jesus is coming back in the east, so now we, we face the congregation to the east, but I, that's not why. But, but we had, uh, I had a rope tied from that side all the way to that side and had a little dot on that rope that you could not even see. And I said, that's eternity. And that dot is you. You can't see it. And sometimes we feel so insignificant that, that God does not hear us because we are that small dot on the line of eternity. But if you'll remember Jeremiah 1, he created us. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He formed us. And he fills us for this time, for his place, for his purpose. And his purpose is his kingdom to come and his will to be done. You know, his will is not mysterious. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that have been asked of him. That, that those requests will manifest because we ask them according to his will. So church, very quickly, three points. Just to, like I said, right now, I'm just laying some groundwork for us to really break this down in the next couple of weeks. First, pay attention to how Jesus says what to pray. He says, our Father. A child will never know their destiny in life 
outside of parental direction. That's how God designed it. That's not how I designed it. Now, what if, what if a child is an orphan? They don't have to be because ultimately God's goal is for him to be our father. So we have an answer for the orphans as well. You don't have to be orphaned. But the church needs to teach you, needs to direct you, and needs to bring you up from having that spirit of being an orphan to a spirit of being a child of the most holy living God. And when we understand that, we can pray our Father, and we understand that we are His children. The second thing is, is Jesus said, hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? We don't use the word hallowed, Halloween. That's what it sounds, but it's not Halloween, right? It's hallowed. What does that mean? It means that he's holy. It means that he's he's about being sanctified in his presence. That simply is a big word, meaning that that what he's done for us, we accept. And we accept that, that the lamb who knew no sin became sin, that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And righteousness means it is as it should be. It may not feel that way, but as I proclaim my father... Then, then I see his value. I see his worthiness to be praised. And, and his worthiness, that's what that word hallowed means. It really means a holy God. He is worthy to be praised, to be honored, to be recognized. So learn to praise. And then finally, three, third thing I would say about prayer this morning that's very simple is declare, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, but your kingdom's first, and your will is first, and that's what's most important in my life, in our lives. You see, this is how it works. When your marriage is struggling, God lets your kingdom come. When your financing, finances are taking a hit, have you ever prayed, prayed, Lord Jesus, let your kingdom come. When disease attacks, Lord, let your kingdom come that the power of the reality of heaven would invade my circumstances at this point in my life. When we pray that way, whatever can be shaken will be shaken, and darkness flees, and orders will, and, and the God of order will come upon us because our God is a God of order on earth as it is in heaven. Some of you are in a tornado this morning. You know you need prayer. I want to encourage you because if we go back, you'll see where Jesus taught his disciples to pray. But when they ask, let us, let us together learn how to pray from one another. I like to go to the intercessory prayer group because they're the special forces prayer group here. And I learn how to pray. And for some of us this morning, as we get ready to have the altar team come forward, come and pray with someone. Because as you pray with someone, you too learn how to pray. Lord, teach us, us how to pray. There are many in this church that know how to pray. Get with them and learn what it means to have a prayer of faith. Prayer of faith. And faith being the currency that moves God on your behalf. Would you please stand? I'm going to ask the altar team to make their way forward this morning. And as the altar team comes forward, some of you feel like you're in that tornado. And and you see the building or the little shed rolling out from you, and and, and you're curious on, on some of this, and your vehicle is shaking. And you got two ways you could go this morning. You could wind up being taken in an ungodly matter, things stolen from you, or... You could catch third gear this morning. It's not fifth. It's third gear and begin to pull out. You know, the neat thing about my life is I've never done this on my own. I grew up alone, but I was never lonely. I grew up that I'd get in off the school bus. I had a three-wheeler because the motorcycle was too dangerous in my mother's eyes. So I had a three-wheeler, which was much safer. And the world was my backyard. And I would get on that three-wheeler and I would go. And you know something I always knew? Because my parents taught me. Because they were faithful with the next generation. 
I was never alone. For years, Allison made fun of me talking to myself outside. And I said, I'm not talking to myself. I've talked to my God since I was a little boy out on the farm by myself. And you know why? Because I wasn't pulled a hundred different places at a hundred miles an hour. I got a school bus and I was at home, but I wasn't alone. You see, how we pray affects every generation. And it teaches the, other gener- the next generation how to hear God and to know what He's called us to do. If I had my own choice, church, in my own flesh with my own kingdom, I would have a ranch between Clayton and Springer, and I wouldn't be here this morning. I wouldn't be in all these conversations in life. I wouldn't have people pulling at me. But the truth is, That's not what's best for his kingdom. And had I not slowed down enough to hear his voice, I would have pursued another kingdom and never found the fulfillment of what it means to be a child of God and to work in his presence for his glory, for his kingdom. And that's where I've heard God speak to me and say, in me, you have the abundant life. There's not another life. This is it, and it's great. Get alone. Hear from your Father. Slow down. Begin to honor Him. Begin to ask Him. Begin to seek Him in church. I'm telling you, you'll see your faith. Begin to pray in God's way, and you'll have many, many testimonials of Him answering your prayer. We're here to pray with you. Father God, thank you for each and every one who's here in your presence. Father, I pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and that your kingdom would come. Father, start with us in Jesus' name. Amen.